Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. So we've got okay. we've got find, we've got rescue. Let's talk about embrace. What does embrace involve? Mike? Well, embrace is another great place that that the faith community can be involved when when we are talking about embrace. In many ways, it's 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 misplaced in our acronym. It almost needs to come right after the find. For us, rescue is holistic, right? It, the the psalmist says, "He brought us out of the miry clay." but he also set our feet on a rock to stay. We could go and find and identify and see a million people extracted from this, but then there's the so what of it all, right? If, if you know, many times, well, every time really, those who come out of this life relapse time and time again. In fact, the different numbers say seven or eight times that a girl person goes back to this life before we can really get them out. And again, it ties to a lot of psychological purposes that that rescue piece is meant to put in place. But under Embrace, what we're finding is whether it's a a labor-trafficked family uh, that we've been working with, whether it's a girl that's been in prostitution or a boy, or even some transgender people who are being exploited in that way, when we get them out, when we work with law enforcement to get them out, they have nothing, nothing. It's almost like disaster relief time because they don't have a place to stay. They don't feel safe or secure. They don't have clothes. They don't have personal items if they're a girl. They have zero. And so we've seen a lot of great partnerships and lasting relationships happen between the faith community and law enforcement because the faith community can come in with their gift cards and with you know, being able to house in a motel for a few nights, cover the expenses you know, until until law enforcement, social services, or or a group like ours can decide where the best place to put the girl is to, to you know, to use frequent flyer miles to transport somebody. You know, we've done that before from Florida to Arkansas or whatever it might be because that's where their exploitation happened to begin with. But it's where their family is, where their support base is, and so for us, embrace really deals with being able to. Um, uh, love on that person in a tangible way that provides for their immediate needs right after they've come out of this very scary situation. Okay, the last one is empower. Uh, Darlene, what does empower involve? Empower is giving these uh, victims the the tools and um, the love that surrounds them that they too can now be restored and go out, empowering them uh, to just be all that they were created to be because they come in one way and especially with us being faith-based, they are a new creation in Messiah. And it's, uh, again, a collaboration with the faith groups who, who has the, uh, the people who are able to come and do the nurturing, who can make these women feel pretty and, and, and come and adorn them and, and give them back the worth that they would be the apple of, uh, of, you know, the Lord's eye and really know how much that they are loved and to provide them ways of uh, furthering their education. And the, the one person that we're going to maybe briefly talk about uh, that real life situation through this last Super Bowl is one, again, that's in this process. You know, they see themselves, they see themselves as uh, without worth. They don't even realize that they see themselves so worthless, so to speak. And when we can come around and provide them education, love, the body, to um, just disciple them Hmm. so that they now can go out. And then we have success stories where people are actually on free going out and sharing their testimonies. Well, I thought that what we would do, since we've worked through now the find, rescue, embrace, and empower, that we might talk about some scenarios that come up that that are that are a part of this, so that people again can can kind of connect the dots. Um, let's talk first. You mentioned the Super Bowl a lot. I thought the Super Bowl was about a football game, so um, so let's let's talk about that. I mean, it's obviously. Um, a big cultural social event drawing a lot of people, and there's a lot that goes on on the side when a Super Bowl happens. So, so why is the Super Bowl such a such a signature event, if I can say it that way, for this kind of a, of an issue, Darlene? Because it attracts uh, a multitude of people, and you'll have guys coming in 
and maybe they may or may not be meeting with their families on the Super Bowl day. But the week prior to that, it's very active. You have men coming out, they're partying, and the opportunity. It's it's just the old. It's it's the uh, you know it's the old adage there where uh, it's the supply and demand that they're going to make these girls. It, it, it's very lucrative for the trafficker to to bring it because you have so many people and so much is going on. Law enforcement has a lot of antennas out for the safety of things, etc. And uh, it's become very prevalent and something that is supposed to be a, a nice thing, a sports event, and you pick two teams and uh, maybe you go in a Super Bowl pool or whatever, has now become uh, very tainted hmm. with the underpinnings of the activity that goes on. And uh, But the, the work for Super Bowl for people begins right after, when one Super Bowl ends, the research and intel begins right afterwards for the next location where Mike and, and other teams in law enforcement are working very hard on intel regarding Phoenix, etc. Hmm. So when you say you've been working the Super Bowl sites for the last seven years, Mike, what exactly does that involve? What do you all do at a Super Bowl? Yeah, again, I, I'd like to point out how this very collaborative endeavor that we do. In fact, that's why we why we focus on the Super Bowl in many ways, at least, at least why Free first started uh, being a part of this coalition that was started uh, actually by an organization called Class Kids, the Florida Coalition Against Human Trafficking. They started this outreach recognizing that, you know, pimps are opportunistic. And and I won't even just say commercial sex, but but labor side of trafficking goes up quite a bit too around the Super Bowl because you're really dealing with an opportunistic environment to cash in on a whole lot of money. So anytime you got a lot of disposable income that comes into any community, in fact, that's why Vegas, in large part, is such a, a hotbed for trafficking because every weekend you got huge amounts of money that come in for you know for all that goes on in Vegas and the conferences that go on. That that pimps are uh, aren't about sex; they're about making money. So they're going to be wherever the most amount of disposable income is for them to be opportunistic to cash in on that. And so what we tried to do when we jumped on early was to recognize big events like the Super Bowl already embedded in that, that concept have a great infrastructure in place. The lines of communication between motels and cab drivers and you know uh, the subway out in New York City and public works departments and all that, they're heightened. And so it, it creates a great opportunity for... A uh, coalition of groups like what we have to kind of come in and piggyback on that on that heightened communication, so that we might bring in the red flags of what human trafficking are to the cab drivers and the the hotline number to call, you know, should they see something suspicious, you know, through the national hotline number to to mobilize. We were class kids who who started uh, the Super Bowl outreach is a, a a very reputable national missing child organization works with the National Center to, um, to, uh, of missing kids to be able to, to identify those who would be missing and vulnerable in the area. And then we go into the business community to be able to put the, the likely faces of children that they will see who are in the area around the event of the Super Bowl. Last year we had, I think, 68 missing ch uh, children in a book that over 5,000 businesses got in the metro area so that as they're doing their normal business or the doorman or the person parking the car is doing what they're doing, they have the ability to help us identify authentically missing children likely in the area for the Super Bowl. We work directly with law enforcement. Uh, we, we actually, Brad Dennis, who, who runs the command center part of what we do, embeds directly with the FBI. And so as we gather information online and other places, we have a, a, a flow of communication directly to law enforcement that they can respond immediately to things that we are seeing on the street, um, you know, when that happens almost in real time. Uh, we're in the school, we do school assemblies. Last year, we are in front of almost 40,000 students in the le week leading up to the Super Bowl with a school assembly program. It's an all-hands-on-deck week, and it really works to help us identify the resources within that community that are available once the Super Bowl is long gone and piece together that collaborative um, relationship that's needed to address trafficking long after the Super Bowl's gone. Yeah, I mean, the hard part of this is that, is that even when you get a, a rescue, we've talked about in Bryce and Empower, but that process of, of really surrounding that person with the support that they need and the time they need just to psychologically recover from what they've been through is a long, 
long, complex process, isn't it? Absolutely. And and um, not one that the church should stay out of, but one we have to be mindful of going in, that this is a long, long, long process that requires people of, of much higher skill set than I have, even in interacting with those psychological needs that the girl has. But there's so many pieces to that they can be a part of. I mean, you know, again, uh, colleges that can offer scholarships and, you know, can continue to tie that to our faith community network or uh, right there in Texas, we have a major partnership with an organization called Sabre, which actually is an international um, technology firm working in hospitality. So they house, you know, orga organizations like uh, Travelocity and other groups like that that are working directly with Free International to provide work for those girls once they're ready to enter the workforce because a big problem there again that, that the church can be a part of in an advocacy sense is many of these girls already have criminal records of, of no doing of their own and when they start to seek employment there's none to have because they, they their resume goes to the very bottom of the list hmm. because they've got a criminal record and so great businesses like that and great universities that are starting to go we recognize this for what it is now we're going to create opportunity uh, for those who've been exploited, you know, but have a hard time getting that leg up because of their criminal past. Okay, let me go through a couple of scenarios here, and uh, because um, it's interesting in preparing for the podcast today, I was uh, visiting with with my uh, personal assistant here, uh, and and she was telling of a story of of a close family friend that she had that that. Uh, that was going through this situation, and we'll keep everybody unidentified, but uh, basically it's a situation of a teenage girl who, for one reason or another, uh, uh, left home, uh, may even have been forced out of home because of her past behavior, that kind of thing, who's now ended up in, in Vegas, caught in a prostitution situation, and the parents find themselves having discovered this, asking, now what do we do? Um, we're, we're just stuck. They have no clue uh, what to do. So what advice would you give to a family that ends up being caught in this kind of situation? Their child's gone missing. Um, they've been looking for them, and lo and behold, they discover they, discover they find them, but then they realize that, they're, that their child is caught. What, what do you recommend? And I'm, I'm asking this really with two ways. One is just the mere discovery, but what if you add the additional feature of the parents may even be feeling a little bit responsible for what's happened because they forced the child out of the house? Yeah. That, you know, uh, um, having been a pastor and, and all that, I mean, relationships and families in general always tend to be complicated in situations like this, you know. Um, one, you just can never lose hope, right? I mean, we deal with that a lot here in, in Vegas, where we're based is a lot of families that, that just didn't know how to handle the scenario, you know, who would, mm -hmm. not knowing really what the dynamics are of the situations, but, but now knowing what's going on, um, again, that's where organizations like Free, I think, become valuable to be able to offer uh, counseling and support to the family as we work with them, but also uh, be able to be on the ground and identify the help that's needed for the girl once we locate her and find her. Uh, oftentimes, you know, if we're dealing with a teenager, like you said, or, or you know, I'm going to assume that means she's still under 18. She is. That, um, you know, if she is in prostitution, she's a traffic victim, uh, straight up and down by definition. She is that. And so uh, as we work to get help for her, um, even if the family wasn't in a situation where they had, you know, where they kicked their daughter out or whatever the scenario is because they didn't know, you know, how to really offer her support. That's where these shelters become very important, too. And there's so many, so many that so few beds in this country for so big need because there is such a unique dynamic now, no matter what, they are not responsible for what the parents aren't for what she's going through now. And you know, again, you added, uh, I don't know if you said this earlier or not, but that whole uh, issue of uh, previous psychological needs, bipolar, mm -hmm. um, all these things. And, and I think I think these issues of, of um, psychological help and need is really a growing need within the faith community to know how to identify you know, uh, different psychological needs that are happening, bipolar, you know, we've seen uh, very um, 
recognized evangelical ministers have, you know, family members commit suicide and other things that that that's a, a another area that the church really needs to begin to get involved with and emphasize on how they can be better, you know, at really helping on the front side of this, you know, again with issues like that or be educated. But but I think first and foremost this family can't blame themselves for what's going on with their daughter right now. Uh, and again, secondly, as people of faith, we think prayer does um, miraculous things. I mean, this is such a, a warfare and such a dark area of ministry and need that that prayer has to be foundational to everything that's going on. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping everyone that hears this podcast, you know, would, would immediately, even in this situation, you know, begin in a preventative prayer sense to be praying for these families you know, that are struggling with situations like this. But but the fact that, that we can connect with this family, identify and find their daughter, and be able to get them the counseling and help they need coming out of that, um, you know, is, is why groups like ours exist. So, so the scenario really is that it, this family could theoretically contact you, an organization like yours, mm -hmm. uh, th to get that kind of help that they need, and really to get the advice and counsel. You all have experience in dealing with this area. Mm -hmm. You know what what the laws are and what the situation is. You have contacts with law enforcement that can put ears to the ground to help, etc. So, so that that uh, the answer is there's help that can be found for this family. Is that right? That's exactly right, and we. Free International's got a national network, so we work everywhere. But in this particular family's case, we are based out of Vegas, so we can we can help very directly in that situation. You know, Dar Darlene, I'm going to ask you a law enforcement question because I think this sometimes comes up. We often hear that that law enforcement uh, tends to be slow to get involved in family scenarios, that kind of thing. But this is not that kind of a situation, is it? It, it this is really. A situation where, where um, if there's information, uh, if if the family, for example, I'll extend the scenario. If the family had information about where this girl was, um, is that something they could contact law enforcement to get help with in terms of trying to find her and locate her, or would they, would they, you know, are their hands tied? No, that is something because, and particularly because she's a minor. Um, absolutely, uh, they can. Uh, and probably should. Uh, you know what? I, it's the collaboration of all all the efforts, though, because uh, she is a victim. So, by definition, as Mike had mentioned earlier, uh, she falls under this human trafficking because she is is a minor. So, absolutely, um, law enforcement should be involved with that. If I can interject real quick, too, I don't know if this particular family's done this yet, but. Uh, filing a missing persons report goes a long way to having that person in the system. So if anything's mm -hmm. ha anything happens where she does get pulled aside on the street or whatever, it would be a way to immediately identify, if not her situation, um, that she is missing, and then the story can be got after she gets extracted from, you know, from the situation. So the point in. point is, if she if a missing persons uh, uh, report is filed, then when they go to check, if should she be stopped for anything, she should turn up, right? She turns up in the system, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then that's something we can do for here. Is if she's missing, she the family files in the state or the city they're at, and then they can contact us since she's likely in Vegas, and we'll we'll file that same missing persons report and connect it here in uh, Las Vegas. Well, it, you know, I, I think that most people would have uh, literally no idea that all that kind of help even potentially exists. So that's a, it's a helpful uh, scenario to work through. Let's go through a second one. This is one that you mentioned, Darlene. You apparently have someone who, who has been was, was rescued out of, a, out of the Super Bowl scenario and is now moving along in the process. You want to develop kind of what this scenario is and what's happening and where the needs are? Well, I was introduced to this uh, young woman at this last Super Bowl in New Jersey. And the history, actually, Mike can uh, identify it because it goes back two years prior at uh, another Super Bowl. And I came in midstream at this Super Bowl when she was actually saying, okay, I want help. And they, they rescued her, and she was staying with us during that outreach. But Mike... Was at a super, correct uh, two week, two years ago where um, she was arrested 
and identified um, and it would take two. This is just one of those examples how victims slip through the cracks. So actually Mike could feel the initial part of this better, the background. Uh, the, the long story short of it was um, once we had gotten this girl uh, out of her situation, we actually had, had to use our network to do it because she was not recovered in New Jersey. We were in New Jersey when a uh, survivor that, that works with us and is part of our school assembly program team um, received a call from this girl saying she needed out. And uh, there's a lot of things tied to that. But she was in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. So, so again, this is where the, the networked faith community help really happened. Or it really was useful because she wasn't going to go to law enforcement. Law enforcement in this situation, I'm not sure likely, you know, would be able to engage at different levels. So it was our network with the faith community that allowed her allowed us to. She's over eighteen, allowed us to get her get her to uh, to New Jersey. But when when she was spending the couple weeks with us in New Jersey, that she did, story came out that two years previous at the Super Bowl, um, through the work. Uh, our coalition was doing in in uh, Indianapolis had identified what was going on and brought down um, that pimp's activity around the Super Bowl. But the pimp had asked her to take the fall legally for what was going on. So she ended up doing jail time because she wanted to stay in her pimp's good um, good wishes, good you know, mm. uh, stay related to him. And so she just connected the dots for us in New Jersey going, I know who you guys are. She said, you are the ones that got me arrested. <laughs> well, when you get the story, she was, and this was a, a state that had done a lot of great work with human trafficking, that they had passed the week of the Super Bowl, significant law to help. But even in there, there's there, it's such a complicated process that, that she ended up going to jail for her pimp. He asked her to do it, and then when she was let loose, she went back to her pimp, and uh, just two years later, it became too much for her, and she wanted out. And so uh, it was just, you know, we'll say a God thing that, you know, our group was the one who got to not only get her out again, but offer her the services, you know, that she needed. And she's she's doing. It, it's been a rough six months, but she's turned a corner and doing uh, wonderfully. Um, as she stays connected to the great people well, of faith. We're working this, with. Is the, this is the illustration of how long this takes, because obviously it took her a couple of years to, from the situation she was initially discovered to the time when she said, yeah, I want out, I need help. And now she's six months into it. I, I guess we're also nine months now, wouldn't it be, from the Super Bowl? And uh, um, nine months out, and she's, she's still having to kind of swim her way out, if I can say it that way. Um, there's still stuff a ahead of her, nine months in. Uh, yeah. What 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 did she have ahead of her? Man, you know, it, there was so much that happened during that six months too, of losing of family members, other things. Because again, if if it were just as simple, and this it wouldn't be simple at all, as the only thing they had to deal with was their exploitation and the healing process. You know, that would be hard enough as it is. But but there's so many other complicated issues like even this scenario with the bipolar and other things that have to be addressed it becomes a, a really a lifetime of healing um, because you're not always just dealing with one aspect because in the in the reentry with family or whatever you've got all those relationships that you've got to go back and and, and address in a fresh way uh, and the perceptions that you're dealing with there et cetera I mean it does seem like it's a pretty deep it's it's a deep pit you're coming out of and uh, and it just takes a long time to to climb out of it and it takes a lot of support to get people there doesn't it it, it does and, I, and I'll make this analogy real quick one thing I've seen over especially the last six years we we partner with an organization called Teen Challenge and it's a it's a great organization been around for a lot of mm -hmm. years but um, you know knowing the history of Teen Challenge it was hard for them to to make a go of it when they first started even because it was seen as social work not, not gospel work, and and you know yet when we started to heal, hear the story of of people being healed, and you know their their addictions almost immediately done away with. That's what really allowed much of the church to be able to embrace Teen Challenge. Well, here we are, you know, fifty years later, and we're dealing with this issue of trafficking. And I've been talking to churches and training churches, and you know, in seminaries and other places. And the interesting dynamic for me has been to see I I have yet to see a girl that we've worked with 
have any immediate level of healing holistically. There's aspects that God has really touched and made whole that moment. But it, this, this long process, what I've seen is God's using the story of these girls as much to transform the church's uh, understanding of what it means to love, and even in many ways, God's love toward the church that He remained faithful, he remains faithful to us even while we are not faithful to Him. That we've really seen that in many churches that have gotten all in with this issue, the dynamic change from this easy fix hey, somebody's out, now they're in our church, everything's great to really what it takes long term to see uh, that person healed, and, and God has really deepened his relationship with those churches and an understanding of, of what this all takes and, and, and what it takes in love for them to, through patience, see this through to the end. Darlene, what is it like to, I mean, you've mentioned that you've gotten involved basically in the last oh, uh, six, seven, eight years or so. Uh, what, what, is, what, is this, uh, what, is, what has this meant to you to, to be able to uh, deal with this? I know that the, one of the reasons we're having the podcast is because you shared with me the, that you were involved in this and it was a concern that you had. Uh, what, what is, what is it uh, – what has what this meant to you as you think about your own Christian walk and Christian life? For me personally, um, just seeing, seeing the brokenness and uh, at the time that I was on a task force, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that God was really pulling my heart uh, to have a, a burden in, in this particular area because being in law enforcement, you pretty much are in the muck and mire 24 7 and you see all kinds of crime and all, all this, all, you know, it's like sin is sin. But um, when you start to meet someone or start to really see the, this, uh, just really touched my heart and to be able to because this came in the latter part of my career, so to be able to then transfer this, being a believer in the government, and then continue with it, and seeing how even the government itself, and when you're working with law enforcement and victim witnesses and like Homeland Security, how they so recognize how integral the church or the body of believers is. To me, that is God doing, you know, nothing's too difficult for you, O oh Lord. Um, I've seen it, and the beauty is you work with many people when in, in this particular thing. Not everybody, faith-based doesn't necessarily mean the Christian, as we all know, and then you, we're working with a lot of agnostics, but... What I really like when we go out is we might have people of different faiths coming and joining in law enforcement. And then what do we as believers always do before we're going out on an outreach or we're coming back? We pray. And to me, just being part of that and sharing that. For, it was difficult for me when I had to hang up the gun and the badge, and I see now the badge is in loose sight, and I've got the retired on it, um, and coming into an NGO, and I was very aware in the beginning, Mike, we can't be vigilantes, and, <laughs> and there was so much of me that wanted to just go in and like, oh, but before I used to be able to do this, and you know, <laughs> And just to hold back. And for me, it was I really starting to learn, be still and know that I'm God and mm. let God just work everything as he does. So I just love um, working with uh, being part of free because I think they are doing some grassroots uh Things I love the fact that uh, my, Mike has just partnered up free with the Miami Law School, and it seems that attorney generals throughout the United States are jumping on board. So there's a part of my law enforcement career that is so tied with what's going on with free in the NGO faith uh, status that I feel like, okay, this is a new creation too. You know, <laughs> what's happening. So yeah. I'm blessed. I'm blessed to, we're blessed to be able to share all of this good stuff because God works all these things for his, his good. To him be all the glory. Hmm. Uh, Mike, let me ask you one final question. If you were to give advice to a, to a pastoral staff, so you know, so you're able to address pastors about about this area, and they go, "I have no clue what what my step should be here." Um, 
but uh, but I sense uh, there's a potential for for encouraging the church in this direction. What advice would you give to pastors? Um, yeah, I'd say uh, get connected with with group like Free or a similar group. Um, you might already have a great relationship in the community you're at. Um, I know what we've always wanted to do with Free is to put the faith community again at the center of this network, uh, whatever it might look like local to where they're at. And this is a very complicated issue. I mean, we could talk weeks on each nuance of all that's going on with trafficking mm -hmm. and the good stuff that's going on, you know, partnerships with major corporations and law schools and the National Association of Attorneys General that, that Free International has. But we have it because um, government and law enforcement, as Darlene is saying, is recognizing, maybe not in a theological sense, but in a pragmatic sense, mm -hmm. that, that the local church is key to addressing this. So, if I was giving... Um, uh, advice to a pastor, which I do often, it's one, recognizing that there's a leadership role to play for that local church in this field of trafficking, but but not trying to own it, but become a part of that network and relationship in an effective way. To lead without trying to own, right, is is really what we've seen great momentum on, is, is it leading where we need to lead, serve where we need to serve, recognizing the resources our churches have. Because, again, I'm a pastor by DNA. I, I know churches want to get involved with trafficking, but they're also involved with 400 other things. You can't, you can't, whatever all in means, you can't go all in because there's not enough resources to address this. But one of the other things I'd like for pastors is there's a lot of hurt going on in our very churches. We've, we've worked with a, a lot of women who were broken and sitting in churches just like the ones we sit in. They were molested. Their their boyfriend was was abusing them. Um, and oftentimes it gets really an issue like trafficking. We all want to jump in on and help with, but we're missing helping some real broken, sexually brokenness in our churches, whether that's pornography, you know, whether it's all these different things that really add to this problem. In fact, real quick, I just saw a research recently um, by a secular organization, Think Tank, uh, out of out of uh, NYU, New York University. And they were doing the best way to prevent human trafficking. They were trying to find the best way to do that. And, and this group, again, no spiritual, moral connection to this issue, just pure data on what would, what would take the money out of human trafficking so that it would no longer exist. And in the end, they said the that they believe what would do that, economically speaking, because these were economists, was building stronger marriages. Because the stronger the marriage is, the less likely these people are, are purchasing sex or looking at porn or whatever these things that drive human trafficking. So I think a lot of times, not only do we want to paint the picture with pastors and churches that this real exploitation is happening on our doorstep, but there's also real things we can solidify in our church that we're already talking about that are going to diminish the demand and see this end in those communities as well. So involvement is a lot easier than people realize, um, but also... Uh, there's a lot of great partnerships they can have to maximize their effectiveness in this. Well, um, Mike and Darlene, I want to thank you for giving us the time to introduce this topic. As you said, we've only scratched the surface. This is the, s the second or third podcast we've done on this topic, and as we often do, we will take a look at this, listen to it, and, and rotate back and think about what can we – should we take a tighter look at uh, to help people kind of get a better grasp about what's possible in terms of ministry. But I think the encouraging thing that I've heard today is, is there are resources and connections that can be made. There are places where people can get help. Uh, there are ways to get informed about what can be done. And, and, and so this – topic doesn't need to be an intimidating topic where where you stay away and just keep it at arm's length and pretend it doesn't exist there actually is a way to dive in and, and get some get some help or find some resources so I want to thank you all for for uh, for making that possible for us thank, oh, you, thank you and we want to thank you for being a part of the table where we discuss issues in God of God and culture and we look forward to having you back soon Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.